Welcome everyone. My name is Catherine dupoulou menager and I'm the Artistic Director of Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival. This is our first on -live inter online international festival. Usually we meet in Sydney at this time of year, but for very obvious reasons that just wasn't possible. So rather than forego the pleasure of meeting, we decided to just jump online. And of course, the great advantage of that is that we can invite writers who might not otherwise be able to get here um, from all around the world. So that's been actually a bonus and we had to have some bonuses at the moment. Um, just uh, before we start, I'd like to thank our principal partner, the City of Sydney. Thank you so much for continuing to support us at this very complicated time. And now I'll start by acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, wherever you're watching from today. We recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Now to our event today. I was gonna say this morning, but of course in the US where Kathy Reich's forensic pathologist and crime fiction queen is based. It's actually eight o'clock at night. So thanks for giving up a bit of your evening, Kathy. You'll all know Kathy's wonderful Tempe Brennan series. I've got all the books on my shelf and um, was very excited by this new one. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you. Um, she'll be interviewed by another forensic pathologist. And if anybody's got an idea what you could call a group of forensic pathologists, let us know. We've come up with a bones, but we're not 100% sure of that. Um, Xanthi is at the University of Newcastle. She's a forensic pathologist and a writer, but not a fiction writer. She writes true crime or, or uh, different kinds of work. Now, I'd like you to tell you how we're going to run the event um, today. Um, the audience, your video and audio have been muted, so you can see us, but we can't see or hear you. Kathy and Xanthi will talk for about 45 to 50 minutes. After 45 minutes, please send, start to send through your questions using the um, Q&A facility. Xanthi will ask Kathy as many of them as she has time for, and we never have time for enough, sadly. Um, I'll come back very briefly at the end to thank our speakers. But now I'll hand over to Xanthi. Thanks very much, Catherine, and welcome everybody, especially Kathy, who is joining us obviously from the US this morning. So um, it's great to have you available to chat with us, as, as Catherine said. So I'm going to be asking, I've got a list of questions um, that I wrote, because um, being a forensic anthropologist as well, um, I was very curious to see how you've made some of the transitions that you have in your career. Um, and I've also tweeted about this event. So I've got some other questions that people have already tweeted to me. So I'll try and get to those as well. But as Catherine said, it's unlikely we'll get through everything this morning, but we'll cover as much as we can. And then we'll start taking questions from the audience. So um, my first question, as I said, I'm also an anthropologist. Um, so we, we share a background, um, but I write factual work. And obviously you've crossed over uh, into the fiction very successfully. And I just wondered how you did that because personally I have no imagination. And so I just can't imagine how you can, how anyone could, could be so successful at both. It's hard to answer that. Um, I wrote, began writing the first book when I made full professor. And I was, that's the highest rank you can attain in a university. So I was free to do um, whatever I wanted to do. And I didn't want to write another textbook or a journal article at that point. So I thought it would be fun to write fiction. I thought it would be a way to bring my science to a broader audience because not many people had heard of forensic anthropology back. This was in, I started the first book, Deja Dead, back in 1994. So um, yeah, all those things came together. Also, I had just worked on a serial murder case in Montreal. So I had the core of an idea for a storyline, and that's a short answer to your question, as I draw on cases that I've worked and, and experiences that I've had. I suppose every writer does that. So I had an idea for a storyline, and I had um, the opportunity, freedom to try something new. So all that came together in 1994, and I thought I would just uh, give it a shot. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no training in creative writing. So I just um, 
decided to write the kind of book I like to read. And that well, was it. Yeah, I just probably, probably the best way to do it. And now there's been what 19 in the series. I am to this weekend finishing number 20, and I will be wow. mailing in the manuscript to number 20 for the Temperance Brennan books. And then there were six young adult books that I did <coughs> with my son. So. And so obviously when you started kind of dabbling, I guess, in writing fiction, you had obviously no clue how successful and, and that it was going to take on a life of its own. Not really. You, you know, <laughs> as you're writing, you think, oh, maybe it'll be a bestseller. Maybe it'll be made into a movie. And then you tell yourself, come on, get real. Maybe you'll <laughs> sell it. Maybe somebody will actually buy it and read it. So and my expectations were quite, quite reasonable, low, let's say. And now it's, it's taken, literally, the, the whole series is taken on a life of its own. I don't know anyone who doesn't actually know about the series. So they've read the books or they've watched the series. And I have to say, you personally helped me because when I would say to people years ago, you know, I'm a forensic anthropologist, they would say, a what? And huh? I would say, bones. And they go, oh, okay, now I know what you do. Because, yeah, it was not a discipline that was well well known of, you know, years ago. Yeah. But now that's fixed my problem. So there you go. There you yes. Go. So what I really liked when I just read, this is uh, the new one. So I've just finished reading this, A Conspiracy of Bones. What I really liked about this book is that you intermix the story with advances in forensic techniques, genuine advances. And I thought that was really interesting because obviously um, you're kind of educating a reader at the same time there, aren't you, with some of these techniques that you're including? Yeah, with a very gentle hand. You don't want to Yes, hopefully I'm educating my reader, but I think a mistake a lot of scientists and professors make when they try to write fiction is they love their subject matter, whether it's, you know, mathematics or dentistry or whatever. So they tend to put way too much in. So I think the, the key to writing fiction and putting the science in is it has to be brief and it has to be jargon free. We have all this specialized terminology we use amongst each other. And it has to be entertaining, which is not a prerequisite for a textbook. So I think those three elements are what make science in fiction um, palatable. I think it's the same, the same skills one uses and addresses a, in addressing a jury. Yeah. You wanna keep your, their attention. You have to put it in terms that they understand, but you don't wanna dumb it down. So it's kind of the same, the same skill set. So you have to make it accessible, basically. Yeah, and you have to make people, you have, the bottom line is I write a good murder mystery. So it had the storyline is, is the bottom line. That's the most important element to me. Well, I really liked, particularly in this one, that you mentioned a newish technique now called phenotyping. And this was a particular interest of mine because, um, I work with police around Australia and provide phenotypes for police when they need them. But for your, for your readership, I thought they may, you know, the people watching today, they may not know what a phenotype looks like. So um, do you want to give a quick description of what that is? And then I'm going to share my screen and actually, I'll do that while you talk to them. And I'll actually show you what my phenotype looks like. So I thought this would be a good idea just to, to give an image to it. Yeah, when you take DNA, you start with a swab, and, and you take the DNA, and from that, they can determine, look, look at certain gene, se gene sequences, and determine things like facial shape, and eye color, and hair color, and also statistical probabilities of ancestry, whether your ancestors came from, um, you know, Southeast Asia, or Western Europe, or Sub-Saharan Africa. And all of that is mixed together and you can create an image such as the one you're seeing on the screen. So this is actually my phenotype. So this is what my DNA says I should look like. Now, the people who created this is actually an American company called Parabon did this. And I gave them a buckle swab, so a cheek swab. So, you know, those little cotton buds that you see wiped in people's mouths on TV shows, um, put one of those, popped it off to the US. And this is what they came back with. Um, so they obviously knew that I had short, dark hair. So the hairstyle was um, tailored for me, but the rest of it is pure DNA. So eye color, hair color, skin color, nose shape, eye shape, ear location, um, and also those ancestral traits. And mine came back as, you know, 
European, Western European, very stock standard. Um, there was, was no surprises there for me. But I think it's amazing that, you know, these DNA technologies can create images such as this um, purely from a buckle swab. So I thought people might want to actually see what, what they actually, you know, what DNA can actually do now. Because I was quite mesmerized when I first saw this, um, that, you know, it was so accurate. I think if you, if you saw this and they were looking for, you know, to identify someone, you would recognize me. And that, that's, that's the point, isn't it? So I thought that was amazing. I loved it that that popped up in the book. And I thought, oh, I'll show them because they won't, they won't really um, understand what we're talking about until... Um, they can maybe see it. So I'll go back to my questions. Right. So um, the link to SARS in the book as well, and there are a number of other elements in there, you know, mentioned conspiracy theories, um, in, even looking at implanting citizens with chips um, and, you know, all of these different elements that kind of came out that were very kind of, kind of the dark conspiratorial elements that were in this particular story were really reflected, I thought, in what's literally going on at the moment. So I wondered how you interwove those and whether that was something when you started writing the book you did intentionally and or whether that was something you built in later, because I didn't, don't know how long it took you to write this or so whether the world was as crazy as it was, is now when you started writing this. Well, that's what inspired it, that the world is oh. as crazy as it is now. Because anybody can get on the internet or you know the airways or uh, radio and put out a blog, whatever, and they can say whatever they want, whether it's true or not. So the average person is constantly forced to sort through all of that misinformation and disinformation and try to figure out what is real and what is not real. And so that's the theme of the book on two levels. Um, on that broader level, how do we sort through all of this ridiculous QAnon conspiracy stuff and you know children are being kidnapped and sent to Mars to be trained in camps that kind of thing how do you sort through that and figure out what's real and especially when you've got people in positions of authority who are you know dishing out disinformation and then also on a personal level for Tempe in this book because she's faced with some um, medical challenges she's had an uninterrupted aneurysm uh, that she's had to have surgery for, and she's fine. They just put these little coils in and it blocks off the aneurysm. It's a little bubble on one of the blood vessels in your brain. But afterwards, she's experiencing some migraine headaches and maybe hallucinations. She's not sure. So for the first time ever in her life, she has to question her own perceptive capabilities. And that's really, frightening for her because she's never had to deal with it. So you've got this, what is real, what is not real, both on the broader level and also for her on a personal level in this book. And I think that really resonated with what's going on at the moment because, you know, I've never really taken much notice of the conspiracy theories, but certainly since COVID's hit, everyone seems to be talking about them, you know, and I've literally heard people say about, you know, when we get the um, vaccine that people are going to be inoculated and they're going to be putting chips in us all. And when I read that in the book, I was like, well, you know, this is really reflective of, of what is going on. And it's now this heightened sense of that and the uncertainty. And I think that it really resonated with literally where we are right now. So I thought that was really interesting. Well, that's what you, I always try to do is to look ahead because the book is going to take a year writing and a year in production. So what is going to be on people's minds two years in the future? And that's that's hard you to must do. You like a crystal ball then because <laughs> this was so well-timed. I was like... How did she know that we were going to be in this crazy place when this book would come out? And yet, you know, everything, everything was reflected in what is generally going on. I was like, yeah, yeah, people are saying those things. Amazing. So you intentionally build the contemporary context into your books, like into the stories and weave those in. Um, contem contemporary background. I do. Yeah. I do. I, I make reference to things that are, you don't want to date your book. You know, the, the, the danger to that is you, you might really fix your book in a time slot and you don't necessarily want to do that. So I try to bring in as much background to make the story relevant and to make it realistic, but without really slotting it into a, you know, a specific year necessarily. Yeah. It might be useful actually, I guess, for some people who haven't had the opportunity to read this yet 
um, if you just want to give kind of a quick synopsis of what is going to happen to Temp in this book and, and the setting for this book, um, obviously without giving away <laughs> the core bits, you know, but um, yeah, um, she's got a lot going on in this book. Um, the story opens, she's yeah. driving home and she gets these text messages with some images and it's the image of a faceless corpse. It's, it's a corpse with no face and no hands and the dentition has been destroyed. So it's a corpse that will not be identifiable using dental records or fingerprints or visually. So it's a classic forensic anthropology case. But there's a new medical examiner. She has a new boss at the medical examiner office in Charlotte. And she and this woman, Dr. Margot Hebner, have history. And we can talk about that if you want. But Margot Hebner, hates her, let's put it that way, and has sworn she will never work in that office again. So she's been banned from the Emmy office. So she gets these images. It's clearly a case that should be a forensic anthropology consult. She sees this new medical examiner making mistakes, and yet she's not allowed to work on the case and get it right and get this person identified. So she ends up having to work outside the system in this book. She's in exile and she has to use her own wits, her own resources, uh, call on her own network of, of colleagues to, uh, to pursue this investigation. I was interested actually in the Hesnick character because in the book, um, she seems quite interested in kind of um, pushing herself forward, using the media to do that, you know, sharing information, that kind of thing that, that, you know, professionally we would consider inappropriate to be talking about your cases in the way that she is. And I wondered if that was kind of um, something you've come across in your career as well and your kind of your commentary on professionalism as well in this book. Yeah, I have seen that happen. Um, and like Tempe, um, I don't like it when that happens. There are certain, you can talk about a case or you can use a case as the basis for a story. Once it's completely resolved, it's been in the media or it's been in public records because there was a court case, um, but you have to change all the details, all the names and the places and the dates. And you have to, you know, be aware of the sensitivity of the persons that were involved in that case. Well, this woman in, in the story, Margot Hebner, writes books. Um, she calls herself Dr. Morgue because she writes books about true cases. And she gets on the air with a known conspiracy theorist. And she talks about things, particularly in the case of the child homicide, that she's revealing confidential information. And also, this conspiracy theorist is an anti-vaccination type. And uh, Hebner's a doctor, and she should say that that is wrong. That is completely unfounded, the link between autism and vaccination. And yet she doesn't. And that infuriates Tempe. So Tempe speaks out, and that's why um, they have this very hostile relationship between them. And there is a really kind of dark thread to this as well. So you mentioned the child death cases there. So um, they are part of this story too. These children are disappearing. Um, some bodies are found and, and some are not. Um, so at the end, the reader doesn't necessarily have, without giving too much away, total closure maybe on all of the threads that are woven through here. Um, and then I wondered why you chose to do that. I thought it, personally, I found it, um, I, I preferred that at the end because in a world where everyone wants everything solved in a TV hour, you know, it's all nicely tied up with a bow, that's not reflective of reality. And so as a reader, I actually preferred it that we didn't get that nice, neat ending for everything. And I wondered why you chose to go that way and whether it was very intentional to leave your reader with that kind of slight lack of closure. Well, I think, as you say, it's, it, every case is not going to be solved. That is one of the falsehoods perpetrated by crime fiction and television shows like, like Bones. Every episode in 52 minutes, we resolve, we catch the bad guy and we identify the, the unidentified body, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's not how it happens in real life. And it was a way to show Tempe recommitting to her um, promise to the dead that she will get them identified, get them back to her families, that she is recommitted to working. She works with the dead, but she's working for the living. 
and um, she will always keep looking um, for these children that are missing or whose bodies have been found and never identified. And that sense of uncertainty that we're kind of left with at the end is really, again, another one of those elements that builds through the book on a number of different ways. Um, what was real, what wasn't, um, both within the stories and for Temp as an individual, but it kind of covered several like layers. So you had the political, the social, personal, everything was kind of mixed in there for her. Um, obviously this was very intentional and it definitely built the tension as you kind of went through the book. Was that another nod to general uncertainty? So you bring in the conspiracy theories and it's all this whole, this whole genre you're kind of bringing together to kind of really give everyone a sense of that uncertainty. I think so, yeah. And this faceless corpse is sort of symbolic of all the faceless dead that um, she's committed to, to helping, to committed to getting a name to them and getting them back to the people who are missing them. And you gave Temp a medical condition in this book, which you mentioned earlier. Um, she had um, an uninterrupted cerebral aneurysm that she's obviously had fixed, but this is still causing us some issues. Um, and when I got to the end of the book, I was surprised to read that you've actually had that yourself. Um, and so, you know, you've kind of woven reality, your own reality in with this as well. And I, that led me to wonder um, what connection, I guess, after, what has it been, almost 25 years you've been writing, like about Temp now? Yeah, um, I what a connection. You must 94. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a long time that you have been connected to this character and you've grown her from that initial imaginings of, you know, who, who your heroine would be. Um, so I wonder what connection you have with her after writing so many of her stories and building this whole person. Um, so, you know, how, how do you fit into Temp? Well, parts of her uh, are taken directly from me. Um, professionally obviously she works in a lab she works in a morgue she works goes to crime scenes and she works with cops so that's you know what i've done forever and ever but i also wanted to give her her own characteristics that were just hers um i didn't want her to be perfect so obviously you know i couldn't draw on me so um i <laughs> gave her you know the difficulty in her past i never go into detail about it but we know she's had this rather colorful period in her life involving alcohol, so she's a non-drinker. Uh, that's definitely not me. I will have a glass of red wine as soon as we finish this interview. Good, good. It's a Friday um, evening. Um, I'm told we have the same sense of humor. My friends say that when they're reading the book and she says something, because she she's a bit of a smart ass. Are we allowed to say smart ass? Um, yeah, we, they, yeah, yeah, we, can hear, <laughs> we can hear you saying exactly that. So she has a, a, a caustic sense of humor, a very sarcastic at times sense of humor. So I think we share that characteristic. But she's also got these traits that are, that are only her own as well. So I wanted her to, to have those flaws and I wanted her to be approachable. I didn't want her to be this perfect superhuman you know, Wonder Woman. And, and the other characters in your books, do you base those on people you know as well? Um, partly. Uh, sometimes uh, they, they derive from different sources, really. Um, Claudel, uh, Luc Claudel, who's one of the detectives in Montreal, he derived from a picture I saw in the newspaper of, of one of the homicide detectives I worked with in in Montreal, and I actually cut it out and stuck it up above my computer, and I used him as the basis for the Luke Fidel characteristic character. Um, others I just put together with bits and pieces of different people that I know. Um, Birdie the cat is is based on a cat I had who's since moved on, uh, named Birdie. So that was based on an actual real character, and Boyd the dog, same thing. But otherwise, they're they're really a a mixture, a melange of, of traits that I that I see in different people. But when you've written about a character like Temp for so long and she's done so many stories, how do you actually keep up with all of the individual characteristics? You know, That's because you've got to keep her accurate. You've got to keep her real. How do you do that? Well, yeah. Um, I keep saying I'm going to write in the writer's room, at, you know, at a, at a TV show, you'll have what's called a Bible, and especially when you go 200 and whatever we did, 240 mm -hmm. something. 245 episodes or something, 12 seasons. You need a Bible so you can go back through previous years and pre previous um, episodes to be sure you're 
keeping something right or not repeating something you've done. I have never done a Bible for the Tempe Brennan series, but I often wish I had because I'll be writing and I'll think, huh, did Claudel have green eyes or blue eyes? And I'll have to, I have all the books on uh, my computer, um, you know, in text form. So I'll have to go back through, figure out the first time I mentioned the character and do a word search, a keyword search and try to figure out, you know, how old he was or what color his eyes were, or is his mother still alive or, you know, whatever it is I'm trying to keep track of. Because you know, if there's a single error in there, people will find it because people know these characters so well. And they will let you know, definitely. Oh, they will. They will, they well, will they definitely will. let Absolutely. you know. So she, she's, she's had an bigger. old friend now. I'm sorry? No, you carry on. I was going to say mystery readers, thriller readers are very, very astute and they will pick up on anything. And um, yeah, whether it's inconsistencies in the characters or anything, I once got a letter, a three page single spaced, little tiny handwritten uh, script from a lady because I had about, uh, I had made a comment, Ryan and Tempe were eating pizza and he said he didn't like, or she did, one of them said they wouldn't eat goat cheese. And the other one said, do you know what goats eat? Well, this lady wrote me in excruciating detail exactly what goats eat to show how clean they are. So you will hear from your readers, which I love actually, most of the time. Yeah, and you've got such obviously a huge fan base, you can't afford to make any mistakes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So Tempe is a bit of you, a bit of somebody else or other people, but she must be like an old friend now after writing about it for so long. So are you willing to give us any I get hints about what might be next for her. You just said you, you know, finished the, the next book in the series, so. Uh, the next book is called The Bone Code. Right. Little departure in the title. And what can I tell you about it? Um, without giving anything away, I've been doing a lot of research for this book on human genome editing. Oh, wow. So again, looking two years from now, what might be on people's minds? I particularly am interested in things in which the development of a technology leads way in advance of legislation to regulate it. When you've got kind of the wild west of we can do this, but should we do this? Yeah. How do we regulate this? So you're watching the medical science literature now, and then you're looking, you're imagining what issues that may cause in the future. And then you're weaving those into your books so that by the time you finish it and it comes out, that's the world we're kind of living in. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes it's just a tiny little, it's not necessarily the medical literature. Sometimes it might be just a tiny little news story that I see on, I don't know, in the New York Times or the Australian papers or Twitter or something. And I go, huh, that's interesting. What if? And then you say to yourself, well, what if this? And what if that? And what if that? And then you spin it off into, into a storyline. And that's the bit that kind of gets me that I c c couldn't do. You know, my brain is purely fractal. I just don't have that imagination. I'm really envious that you can see as something, a, a nugget, and turn that into a part of a story and imagine this whole tapestry that can be built around that. That's really quite a skill. Well, that's and obviously that's why the book is, yeah and that's why obviously it's so successful is because you've got that ability to do that so you're, you never switch off then all the time you're just kind of on the lookout for these little grains that oh, can yeah. Turn. oh yeah interesting characters interesting storylines interesting settings i'm constantly on the on the lookout on the prowl yes exactly so You've obviously written 20 of these. You've written another, um, I think, five books as well with your son, correct? Five or six. So five or six. We've got a collection six, of short six. stories also, yeah. So obviously, you know, writing is, is a massive part of what you do. What's next for you as, a, as an author? Well, who knows? Um, I was, my son, after we did the viral series, he... Um, dumped me, basically. <laughs> <laughs> only, only in the way kids can. And huh? he signed a contract and he went and he did his own three book uh, young adult series. And now he's just done a 
three book middle grade series. And he was over the other night and we were talking about the possibility of doing an adult book together. So that could be fun, just a, a completely different idea, different character. So would you, because that would be a real diversion for you because all of your adult books have all been temp books, haven't they? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, so that, would you create? Would you create no, a new? We haven't gotten to that point yet. Yeah, create something new and different. And we worked well together, which is surprising. First of all, because he's my son. Second of all, he's a litigator. He's a lawyer, and a litigator. So you know, our artistic diff, our editorial meetings could be quite interesting. But uh, we did work together well, and. You know, he's talking about maybe wanting to do it again. So who knows? Who knows? Well, that would be interesting for your audience, you know, because you've always stuck to temp. And so possibly there may be another character in the wind. We'll have to wait and see. But um, that actually leads me to one of the questions I was, I was asked to ask you. Um, you always have stuck to temp, you know, since that, that first, you know, book now 20 20 books ago. Um, why have you chosen to do that? Because a lot of writers will have a number of heroes or heroines, you know, different main characters, but you've always been loyal to Temp. Um, why? Well, my, that's what my readers wanted. That's what my publisher wanted. <laughs> so we will, we're offering you oh, a contract books. for five books and we would like them to be Temperance Brennan books. So that kind of locks you in. But I've done other things. I've done, I did yeah, one but thing then Really fun is I did a short story with Lee Child and in a book called um, Match Up. And the book, the, the theme of the anthology was bringing together a male writer and protagonist with a female writer and protagonist. So Lee and I brought together um, Jack Reacher and Temperance Brennan. And that was, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I imagine it would be. Yeah, two really big characters. Yeah, and Lee is um, so a delight to work with. Wow. So um, you've talked a little bit about kind of gently educating your reader um, in kind of realities of science. Um, so, how, and this is another question from, from that I was asked to, from Twitter I was asked to ask you. So how does fiction and TV, so CSI, you know, all, you know the CSI effect, what would it be probably 25 years ago now has kind of changed the way everyone looks at forensic science. Um, and it's changed the way the general public look at science and police work. So how do you feel, I guess, about the fictionalization of forensic science and, and the perception of that in the public? Does it matter well, that people don't really understand? Well, I think shows like Bones and CSI are good in that they have educated the public to the power of forensic science. It's a, like DNA is a very powerful tool, but it cannot solve everything. So it has given the public some misconceptions such as DNA will solve everything. It will be done in every case, even you know a minor traffic accident. Um, so that's unfortunate. Um, it also has given the public the um, misperception that every case is resolved. Um, that's unfortunate, but I think the good that comes out of it over, overrides those unfortunate outcomes in that it does make people aware of the power of forensic science. And also, I think it's fantastic that little girls are watching these shows and reading these books and they are becoming aware of um, the idea that it's, it's, it's cool. It's cool for girls to like science. That's why when Brendan and I decided to do a young adult series. Our main character was Temperance Brennan's 14-year-old great niece, uh, Tori Brennan, a little girl, a 14-year-old girl. And she and her friends, three, her best friends are all boys, um, but they use science to solve mysteries and cold cases at kind of a middle school level. And hopefully that empowers young girls to, um, to go into the to STEM, go into yeah. all of the science technologies engineering and math is that what it stands for yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. i think actually i think the audience might be surprised to learn that um the vast majority of forensic anthropologists are female so i worked at the university of dundee in the forensic anthropology center there and like 90 percent of our students were female and all of the forensic anthropologists i know in australia are female 
So I think um, we do have stereotypes that, you know, a lot of these roles are male dominated in the sciences, but actually something about forensic anthropology draws women in. Um, well, I don't yeah. know if you've ever thought about that and why. A journalist once asked me about how skewed it was, the, the gender ratio. So we got down the list of um, board certified individuals in different fields. And dentistry was like 99 men and yeah. one woman. Uh, engineering, terribly skewed. But anthropology at that time was running about three to one. So anthropology was much better off in terms of, of gender balance. I think maybe because it's academically based rather than, you know, like some of these other disciplines that are not uh, based in universities so much. Maybe, who knows? Yeah, I don't know. I just noticed that it's it's all a lot of it is women and, and I've never really figured out why they're so drawn specifically to becoming forensic anthropologists. I don't know. I haven't figured it, maybe, but maybe it's, it's a trend that I've seen over certainly maybe I don't maybe it is. I don't know. There's something that's really encouraging women to to study this as a science. So I think that's great. Um and I think some people are also probably surprised at just what you've achieved actually as a forensic anthropologist as well. So you've got, I don't know, do you ever sleep? I did wonder that. You've got all these books and then you've done. I do. I'm not one of these people that can get by on a minute, you know, four hours a night. Apparently that's genetically based, I just learned. But um, yeah, I, I, need, I need six to eight in there. So I definitely sleep. Because you've also done some quite remarkable things as a forensic anthropologist you know, all of the cases you've worked on. And, and we've just had a really important anniversary on 9-11 after the Twin Tower bombings. Um, and okay. you actually present at that event helping to identify some of the victims there too, weren't you? I did as part of a DMORT, which is Disaster Mortuary Operational Response Teams. It's a network, a federal network here in the US. So I was deployed to Ground Zero with DMORT um, following the Twin Tower disaster. Yeah. Yeah, so what, 19 years ago? Yes, yeah, 19 years ago, yeah. Um, another question I was asked to ask you, um, I, what are your views on why people are so interested in forensics and how science is used in crime investigation? Because, you know, fictional, true crime, it's, I mean, it's always been popular, but it's certainly exploded even more recently with the amount of podcasts available and everything else. So why do you think people are fascinated with this? I have certainly noticed an explosion of true crime recently in the podcasts. There are scores of them. I don't know. It seems to me it, the interest in forensic science in general goes back somewhere to the 90s, to about the time I started writing um, the first Temperance Brennan book. And here in the U.S., what was happening is we were exposed daily to the O.J. Simpson trial, and people heard constantly about blood spatter pattern analysis and DNA and cut wound trajectory. You know, and I think maybe people became aware of, of forensic science at that time. And then of course, beginning around that time, there were also a number of book series and CSI, the show came out. And so, it, you know, it just, it was a feedback cycle. The more people saw, the more interested they become. And the more they interested they become, the more of books and shows appearing. Oh, sorry. I had it turned off, but for some reason my alarm went off. That was weird. Well, actually, it was, it was brilliant time because it's now 22. Um, so, oh, great. So people have started to ask questions in the chat section too. So now if you want to start posting your questions, I can start to ask Kathy those. So this is your opportunity. So the first one's come in from Jenny. Um, how do you write? What's your daily regime and how much time on a research, oh, how much time on research as opposed to writing? Oh, um, my daily re regime is that I get up out of bed. I try to get at the computer. I was just double checking to be sure. That was the alarm, which I had set to do this interview, but I must have had it off by one hour. So, um, I, I try to get to the computer by eight, eight thirty. Um, I write straight through, but by, by the time I look at the clock, it's usually 1.30, quarter to two. 
and then I break and I have lunch. And then um, sometimes I write more. Usually now I don't, I, I maybe work out. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, and, and do other things in the later part of the day. I'm constantly researching. Um, my process is that I come up with the idea and then I go through the, well, what if, and what if this, and what if that, what if that process? I do a little bit of outlining. I'm not an outlining, uh, you know, we talk about um, plotters and pantsers, people who plot everything out and then people who do it by the seat of their pants. Um, I'm more of a pantser. I will outline the first six to eight chapters of the book and then I just start writing. Um, I write in a very linear way my daughter, who's a writer, if she's in a good mood, she writes the love scene. And if she's in a grumpy mood, she writes the murder, you know, the death scene. I, that's just wrong. <laughs> I start with chapter one and then chapter two and then chapter three. I do it in a, in a linear fashion, but it's also feedback. As I'm writing, um, I may come up, I'll be researching something and stumble across something else. And I'll think that's great stuff. I'm going to use this. And then I have to go back and make changes earlier in the manuscript. So it's also a feedback um, process as I write. That was a very long rambling answer. Did that answer the question at all? You have gone mute. So yes, no, that was great. So um, they also asked if you keep notebooks. So say if you come up with an idea, but it may not work in this book, do you kind of save that and, and have an ongoing kind of list yeah. of things you wanna do? I do. I have what's called future stories file and it's full of newspaper clippings and yeah, jottings and that kind of thing. I do. Um, also, as I'm writing, um, I keep files on things. I don't do an outline before I write the book, but as I write the book, every time I do every chapter as a separate file. And as I finish the chapter, I add it to the main manuscript. And then I also, um, I'm creating retroactively an outline. So as I finish chapter two, I add chapter two to the outline. As I finish chapter three, I add chapter three to the outline. So that if I need to go back and check something in the story, I know where it took place. Does that make any sense? And do you know the ending when you start? I do, I do. I mean, I write thrillers, so they're a bit formulaic, you know, the bad guy or girl is going to get caught. And um, so, but I don't always know specifically who the bad guy is until later in the story. And as you're writing, it's fair to put in red herrings and false clues, as long as you tie them off and as long as they make sense and you can't rely on coincidence. So sometimes as I'm going along, I might change who the bad, who the villain is going to be. Yeah, and I guess your reader wants that. They want, you know, they want to be guessing. They don't want to know, you know, and have the answer straight at the beginning because that's, you know, why are you going to read to the end? Um, so Charlene has said, thank you for a very interesting discussion. I love all the temp books. Um, I'm quite sure there would be many people who would be happy to develop the Bible um, you said you <laughs> wished you'd, you'd kept back then. Aren't you ever tempted to go back and do that? Because if you're going to keep writing, I know. Books, which we all hope you are. It would take so long. You need um, the Bible. I did, I did begin to make a family history of, of who everybody, when her father was born and when he died and when her mother was born and, you know, when she did this and that and the other and her sister. I did start to do that. I didn't finish it. But <laughs> yeah, I should. It would just be so time consuming with 20 books now. And each book has your, your core uh, cast of characters, but each book also has brand new characters being introduced. So you'd have to, uh, and sometimes I bring them back. Occasionally they come back um, in later books, but. You must have an incredible memory then to have all of this stored in here and, and not have to have that Bible? You know, just recently I had to say to my assistant, um, I know I wrote about this, <laughs> figure out which book this development oh, wow. took place. <laughs> so she had to go through with a keyword search and, and we found it and, and, you know, got the answer. But yeah, there's a lot of material when you've got 20 books now. Wow. And they're also yeah, short stories. That's quite an astonishing 
Yeah, four short stories. So you've got to keep track of what's going on in those also. I do not know how you do it, to be honest. Um, <laughs> Zoe's asked, to what extent does your first draft differ from the final published novel? Um, okay, when I write, I'm constantly editing. Every time I sit down, every day I sit down to write, I open that file, that chapter, and I edit, 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 up to the point where I left off. So by the time I finish a chapter, it's been edited, oh, lots, lots of times. Then I put it into the main manuscript. Then about a quarter of the way through, I'll print that out, hard copy, I'm old fashioned, and I'll edit that. And then when it's half finished, three quarters finished, when it's finally finished, I go through the whole thing and I edit it again. So when I turn in a manuscript, it's pretty clean. Um, so the, the suggestions that I get from my editor um, up until recently have been very minor. So my first draft is usually, to answer your question, very close to what my final draft turns out to be. I've how, never had to do a major, a major edit of any kind. And how long does that process actually take you for every book? Because that is, how long, oh, my internet's gone a bit dodgy. Hopefully you can hear yeah. me. How long does that process take you? Because that's an exhaustive process to get it to submission. I've been doing a book a year. Um, pretty much every year. I took a gap year because of the aneurysm thing. Um, but otherwise, I've released a book every year since um, 1997, I think it is. Yeah. And the second part of Zoe's question, how much influence does your publisher have on your work? They are, they, the editing is, is, is very light. They don't give me any suggestion whatsoever. Um, I will turn, there will come a point, um, and I think I got into this pattern because when I wrote the first book, I didn't have a publisher. And so I just wrote it and turned it in complete. So that's pretty much the pattern I've continued to follow. I write the book. Um, so there comes a point where they want to know what it's, what it's about it, because they have to do cover art and marketing and, you know, cover copy and that sort of thing. And I, I, I probably will give them at that point the first six to eight chapters. But after that, um, I finish the book and I, I turn it in um, complete. They know the general theme, but they really don't see it until, until it's finished. So they don't kind of, um, I go, guess, give you ideas of future directions or anything like that? It's all, it's all you? Pretty much, yeah. Pretty um, much. Rachel. So far, <laughs> so far, I'm sure they're going to. But still, you know what? Every time I turn one in, even this is number twenty. Every time I turn it in, for the next week or whenever I get their feedback, I'm always like, "Oh my God, they're going to hate it. They hate it. They don't like it. Why haven't I heard from them?" You know, and it's like the next day or something. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you said that because every I've done three. Um, factual books for the uh, public audience now and I have that same fear but I wouldn't have expected you to um, so it's kind of nice to know that every single book well that kind of makes me, <laughs> makes me feel a bit better that it's not just me that has that waiting for those editorials to come back it's like oh um, so Reagan has asked um, she said thank you for your great insight into the process of actually writing your books um, did you take classes on how to creatively write or was it just a passion that you've refined over time I did not um, when I was in as an undergraduate I avoided uh, literature classes um, I took introduction to poetry and introduction to fiction because you had to do two you had to do a sequence and then I took science classes so I have no training in, um, in writing. I just, I just kind of do it by the seat of my pants. My son, um, who decided to be a writer, uh, re, you know, he and I wrote the virals book together. He then went and got an MFA, a master in fine arts in creative writing. So he has a very specific and elaborate process of outlining. And he, he actually has a big whiteboard with color-coded cards and every character and every scene kind of like we do in the writer's room when writing an episode you 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 go in and you do what's called breaking the story 
And that's really fun because it's the whole group of writers, all the staff writers, um, and together you collectively shout out ideas and you brainstorm. And then when you start, there are these terrifyingly empty whiteboards on the wall and ours would be divided into six, six acts. And by the end of um, a week or two, you will have plotted out every beat in your story, your main story, your secondary story, your third level story. Um, yeah, so my son plots out his, his books like that. I, I don't, it's more of an intuitive kind of thing. I probably should do more of that. But... Oh, I think you're doing all right, to be honest. <laughs> I think however you do it is working for you. So I would. <laughs> Did it change the way you write them? Is that um, informed, like, the way you write your books? Has it changed the way you write? Um, the fact that I w wrote for television, you mean? Yeah, screen? two different. I, yeah. yeah, I don't think so. It, it's quite different because when you're writing a screenplay for television. You don't have to put in anything descriptive because the viewer sees that. So it really boils down to um, dialogue much more so. Um, and you're telling your story through dialogue because they're seeing the rest of it on screen. So I don't think that has impacted. It may have made me more aware of balancing your A story with your B story, with your C story, that kind of thing. And, and you know, following arcs um, yep. through the book and following continuing arcs from one book to the next book, because we did some of that. Um, Hillary has asked, you obviously spend a lot of time writing. Would you please share a little bit about how much time you devote to forensic anthropology in the real world? Yeah, unfortunately, not any at all anymore, because as I said, there came a point where I was writing a Temperance Brennan book every year, a young adult book every year, and a screenplay every year, and something had to give. So what had to give was, was casework. So I'm still available um, if my, the lab, particularly the lab in Montreal, would need me for something particularly complicated, I'm available, but I'm not doing any casework on a regular basis anymore. But you obviously keep up with the literature and everything else because that's all, you know, coming out in your yeah. stories. Yes, I saw him. I saw him go by. Is that your husband? Yes, yeah, he's <laughs> in the background. I mean, he's painting something outside. <laughs> Second time. The fumes are wafting in and I'm like, if I pass out, it's his fault, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, I uh, forgot what the question was. Um, so how much time devoting to forensic anthropology? So obviously, yeah. you know, you don't have time, but you obviously keep up with everything. I do. I read our journals. Um, I interact with colleagues regularly. I, not this year, of course, but I attend uh, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences annual meeting, which is where all of the forensic scientists in, uh, in North America uh, belong and we attend. So I, I talk to colleagues, I, I attend scientific presentations at the meeting, so um, I keep up on what's going on and, you know, suck up. As I said in the, in the little article at the back of this book, I'm like an ant with my feelers out there, just, just searching around for, for ideas for new books. Um, and so Kay has asked, does the book contract spe specify a word number or does the, this work out by instinct or do you need to modify the plot to meet it? How does it work in terms of you know, that deliverable? Yeah, I think the contracts do specify a word number. <laughs> I, I've never thought in terms of word numbers. I was just too naive when I started writing. I thought in terms of like, okay, I should have about 30 chapters and they should be 10 pages each. Um, so whatever that comes out to it. But I think the contract does say like, 90 to 120,000 words. Does that sound right? Yeah, it does. Um, and I'm just looking at the size of your book compared to, I've got mine sitting over there. Mine's, I think, 80 something. And uh, yeah, okay. you look to be probably about 85, 90, something like that, I'd guess. Yeah, yeah. but I, that's just not how I think. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, and you need it to be long enough, but not overwhelming. You know, so each story has got to be, again, it's accessible to your reader. Yeah, and it depends, you know, my 30 to 40 chapters, the one I just finished, it's 40 chapters. 
so and they're like I don't know of course it depends on your font too <laughs> how long your chapters are <laughs> so yeah so this one's yeah 340 pages so yeah it's um yeah it's it's enough but I guess then that leads you into the next one doesn't it because each one is a stepping stone in your story yeah well each of the so books is 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 a self-contained story um you don't have to read any of the ones before or any of the ones after um each one is resolved you know within like an episode of bones each one is resolved within that particular book or that particular episode with one exception um my 10th book no my seventh book um is picked up again 10 years later in my 17th book because that was the, the seventh book was the only one in which the villain uh got away so i revisited that 10 years later you brought them back again wow <laughs> So, oh, my internet's gone a bit unstable, but it's okay because Catherine's picture has just popped up. So this is a signal to me that that's, we're probably going to get to the end of our questions now. And I hand back to Catherine to thank you very much for your time. But I just wanted to say it was great for me to talk to you, you know, um, meeting other forensic anthropologists, and especially one who, who can also write fiction is, is really quite remarkable for me. So it was great to meet you and talk to you and um, may even catch up for you with one of those forensic science meetings one day. Well, um, hopefully I'll get to Australia one of these days. I was supposed to come last uh, this year and then, yeah. Well, we're delighted well, you, you were need a guide, able to yeah. We're really delighted you were able to join us online, Cathy. We looked forward so much to seeing you in the flesh. But well, thank you. Maybe next time. Now, I've been keeping track of a few suggestions people have made about the collective noun for forensic pathologists. Oh, we possibly have a skeleton, well, which an might idea. work, but I really like an autopsy of forensic pathologists. <laughs> okay, or a post-mortem. <laughs> oh, post-mortem, yes, that would work really well too. Look, thank you so much to both of you. I think this, this Tempe book has been very to me, has read much, it's been very dark compared to some of the others. And it is a bit ESP that you should um, have done that. Uh, perhaps that's the zeitgeist that you picked up on, then you could really see which way the world was going. But there are, there are, there's definitely a darkness in this book, or it seemed darker to me. But, but I love the way that you, the Tempe keeps going and you work through and we'll all be looking out for that next one. Is there a title yet or do we have to wait? The Bone Code, yes. Oh, The Bone and Code, you it's did say. It's already available for pre-order, so. Wow. Well, that tells everybody what they should be doing. Um, <laughs> in fact, if anybody hasn't yet read A Conspiracy of Bones, you can go online to our um, partner bookseller, Dimux, just key in Bad Sydney and uh, Dimux, and you can buy Kathy's book there. They have all, her, all your other books as well, of course. I hope you enjoy that glass of Pinot, of, of Pinot Rouge, I'm assuming, Pinot Noir, yes. um, after this evening. Um, and I'd like to thank the City of Sydney, who are our main sponsor once again. Now, our next event um, at six o'clock tonight, this time not America, but Scandinavia we go and hear Camilla Leckberg. And if you don't yet have a ticket, it's not too late to do that. It's a great book with a very good revengeful ending. I, I probably sound rather nasty there, but it really is worth, um, absolutely worth reading. But first of all, let's say thank you so much to Cathy and Antizanthi. And we're looking forward to seeing you here, maybe next year, Cathy, with the book. I would love that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye.